Love podcast, hate nonsense <laughs> at the Baldur's Show podcast! Yay! <laughs> yes! Yay! Last one of the year! Yeah! Last one of 2023, last one ever. Podcast is over. What? Bad news. They asked me to tell you on air. Why you, uh... To capture your live reaction. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's so cringe. Yeah, yes. Um, um, how do you feel about this being the last one of the year? How do you feel, like in general? In general, <laughs> that's quite nice to ask. You've never asked me that before. Um, I feel okay. How are you? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Good. I did something mental this morning. What? You know, okay. We were talking about how we were tired. Yeah. Very tired. Yes. So this morning I was on something very, very early before I came. I was doing the papers somewhere, mm -hmm. like reviewing the papers. And I'd taken like a couple of kiwis to eat and like about like seven o'clock. I was I've like- I've taken a couple of keys. I thought that's- No, <laughs> kiwis in the fruit. I can't, I can't get up at that time in the morning, so. <laughs> no, kiwis. Anyway, so I went to cut the kiwi and then like, I realized like the plate was like full of blood and I was like, whoops. <laughs> and like, oh my God. I like, cut my finger. Oh fuck, that's quite a bad cut. <laughs> yeah. But it was insane, and it was you hadn't like a room, room full of people. I was like, "Sorry, so I could have a plaster." <laughs> Just to like go to the sink awkwardly with like my all my platelets on the plate. Yeah, something you don't really do as an adult, really. You don't really get bruises. I didn't even feel it. I was yeah, just that's like, mental. I grated oh. my finger the other day. Did you? Or like, I was grating a cat on my knuckle, I suppose. Oh my god, what did you do with the? Oh god, we're it, it wasn't like bad. Put it on the food. I actually didn't. Oh. No I didn't notice. The, did the great skin go on the food? I suppose it must have done. <laughs> Ava is dry heaving for the listener. I've got really bad. When I was with Sean once, we mm. were in Weymouth. Actually, we could talk about the Bibby Stockholm. It was where we went to go and film the Bibby Stockholm. And then we were boxing in the town centre afterwards in in Weymouth, not in not where the Bibby is. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd been boxing in this one area for like ages. And, uh, and then, like, we suddenly like, looked, Sean was like, oh my God. So we looked at the floor and there was like a bird that had like been completely eaten <laughs> apart from the carcass. <laughs> and, like it was still like splayed open like that. Oh my God. And like you could see like the entire, like, it'd been lit clean. Yeah, I, I wasn't very good. And he thought I was, <laughs> I had to go and sit down. I did, I had to, I had to go and do but some deep breath. I can't remember where it was, but somewhere quite recently, I saw a bird eating another bird, which felt, that felt wrong. That shouldn't. Have, that felt like God is against that. Oh God, Jesus Christ! I don't think you should. I don't. I don't think you should do bird cannibalism. No. So are you doing turkey this Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm doing a um, what was it the four birds roast? But well, when they're all stuffed inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so doing that, but making sure the turkey eats the chicken and the chicken is eating the goose That's and the goose disgusting. eats the duck. Are you a goose man? No, I've never had a goose actually. No. I bet I'd like it. Um, what do you have at Christmas? Because they was vegetarian, that's what I was asking. I just have the bits. Oh, you, they don't do like a nut roast or something? Well, I have had years before where I've done the nut roast and it, it's been like, it, it's been an annoyance on the plate because yeah. we also have like, um, we're a very Catholic family mm -hmm. and my mum is a very South London woman. So you, those two things combined, the Italian South London in her means mm -hmm. that you have to finish your plate. <laughs> and like, so like the nut roast became very cumbersome because I'd want to eat like all of, like Christmas you have bits. like so many trips, yeah, like, yeah. you know, so many bits, don't you? Mm -hmm. And like, I really like veg, you know, like all the like, I love the Brussels, I mm -hmm. love all like the buttered cabbage and all mm -hmm. of that sort of stuff. And. Nut roast, it doesn't sound appealing either. It's not something that. Well, it's just like a big hunk of stuffing, isn't it? And if you yeah. put stuffing anyway on the table, why but do you stuffing, nut roast? But the stuffing's presumably meat. No, no, I make it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no meat in the stuffing. I thought, I thought you, said you were going to suddenly realise that you actually weren't a vegetarian. <laughs> no, um, I do eat, I'm like not, um, I've done it for like 15 years and I'm not like a fussy, fussy vegetarian. Mm -hmm. So like if the gravy is Not like, one of the moany ones. No, like if the gravy's got like meat stock in it or whatever, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll eat it. Ah, that's very open-minded of you. Well, I just don't, I, it comes out of like an embarrassment of not wanting to cause a fuss. <laughs> And so I just yeah. eat it. <laughs> I, th I, yeah, I think there's a balance between that, isn't there? I think if it's being made anyway, you haven't actively contributed to it, have you? Yeah. I mean, I could just open the bisto, couldn't I, and make my own. Maybe I should do that this year. But, we, but we, it would taste worse, though. No, but I don't, it's not, it's not that. I don't really have, like, the, the flavor. I don't have the craving for me, I think. It's really gone for me. Got you. You know, my palate's numbed. Maybe on pod next year, you could eat some 
Ham. There was once an editor who wanted me to go and film a video where I ate um, meat for the first time. That's a good video. And they were very, very forceful on it. And I was really? like, I don't want to do that. I think, if, <laughs> I genuinely think if that's an interesting video, as in, I don't think you should do it. No. I think I would watch a video of someone eating meat if they were vegetarian. Yeah. Someone who'd never eaten meat at all, I'd watch that video. Yeah. I didn't want to do it. No. Especially like, the, yeah. No, completely fair. That's completely fair enough. We wouldn't do that then. I'll but maybe, maybe we should do it. I think we should well, in terms of the, let us know the views. Let us know if you want to watch that. Ava, this is our end of year special. Mm. And I say the theme, the title, the thesis of what we're going to talk about is did the Conservatives have a good year? Yeah, so this is sort of like the fan de siècle, hasn't it? It's been for the, the, the Tories. <laughs> I now realise what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, the fan de siècle? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck's that? Well, this is like, presumably, this is the last Christmas that the Conservatives will be in government mm, they could, for a few years. Presumably. Well, they could do it uh, an election yeah, in 2025. They could have the election in January 2025. Yeah. No, wait, wasn't that ruled out? Because didn't, didn't Jeremy Hunt, um, wasn't he at a, a think tank and he said, we've got an election next year. And everyone went, oh, that means... That well, that, well, no, it didn't rule it out, I don't think. I don't think that rules out a January 2025 election if he said it offhand at a think tank. All right. Is my reading on that. But you know, Labour, Labour in full um, election mode, mm -hmm. all of them. Yeah. So this not not policy wise, but they are they they are like behind the scenes. They are very much prepping for. They're they're going to be meeting with. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to report that. Yeah, they'll they they'll, they'll be meeting with like. Um, civil servants will explain how departments work mm -hmm. to potential secretaries of state i mean they they are really in the the full swing of mm -hmm. we are going to be in government next year so what we could we, we should we should call this this is the christmas this is the decadence right this decadent december this is the last <laughs> rishi start packing your boxes uh, rishi's last christmas last christmas signed by rishi sunak yeah or the um e17 video that we did on our channel. Wouldn't it be so much fun if they did the election like Noel Edmonds announced it and it was like deal or no deal? And like, <laughs> it's like the incumbent prime minister is like in the middle uh -huh. and he'll be like, right, I'll open Batley and Spen. Uh -huh. And then it'll be like the current MP opens it and uh -huh. it'll be like, oh, <laughs> and then it'll be like, you're not giving us seats. <laughs> <laughs> it's even exit pool. Yeah. The whole thing turns into pantomime. Yeah. That, a long, a long episode of Deal or No Deal. But importantly that Noel Edmonds is hosting it. Yes, yeah, true. I don't think, oh, he, he wouldn't do that because he lives in New Zealand now. He might come back for that. I think he would. Well, they brought back Deal or No Deal and it's not presented by him anymore. Yeah, but do you not think he'd come back for like the election special? I think we should give Stephen Mulherin a chance. No, we if we're giving it to anyone, it's Alan Titchmarsh. <laughs> I think he'd be worse at that. Alan Titchmarsh? Uh, what are you talking about? I don't think he'd be a, as good a presenter at that specific instance than... As Stephen Mulhern. Yes. I think Stephen Mulhern is very good. I'm not even joking. I think he's very talented. Have you ever watched him for a penny? No. It's so funny. <laughs> so It's so like... They just do like a game show, but it's like a vox pop. And they just recruit people on the street to come and just do dumb things for like a hundred quid. It's very funny. If you're ever watching ITV on a Saturday night at about 7pm, then I would, ha would highly recommend. I'm, I'm rarely watching ITV on a Saturday night at 7pm. Why? What are you doing? <sighs> I don't know, Ed. Something disgraceful. <laughs> something awful. <laughs> keys. Probably. You have your keys after work, but not. It's just something awful. Right, watching we... reruns of Deal or No Deal. <laughs> <laughs> Ignoring Stephen Mulherin's presenting prowess. No, no, no. I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a um, Noel Edmonds purist. Oh. I think, that's, I think that's good. Okay, what about Richard Maidley hosts it? That would actually be unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> the complete lack of sensitivity. He's like, oh. he's like, I don't know, um, Hitchin and Harpenden. Oh, um, well, the thing about the Hitler Youth is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, Alicia Kearns, uh, you've lost your suit. And good riddance! Yeah, yeah. Good riddance. No. You might say you deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. You might say that. Someone might say that. Someone might say that. <laughs> it should be... Where, where even to start with the year that the Conservatives have had? Well, let me, let, me, let me start you off in January because this is thematic. Quite obvious. Okay, so I'll start you off in January. Now, you might remember that the former Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi, was in hot water because he was found to have breached the ministerial code by failing to declare the HMRC investigation into his 
tax affairs. Mm -hmm. Now, listeners who are also listening, who are also uh, tuning into Monday's episode, mm -hmm. might remember that Michelle Moan did not report things correctly to the press. Yes. Well, here's mm. another one for you boys. <laughs> mm. Nadim Zahawi um, d refused to declare that he paid a settlement to HMRC, which means that he didn't correctly record his tax. Um, and then that kind of became a theme, not the tax, but the... Inaccuracy. The kind of... Basically, the entire theme of 2023 has been... Minister, did you do this? No, how dare you ask me this? Yeah, okay, but Minister, we've done a Freedom of Information request and it really seems like you did do it. Look, <laughs> I didn't know about it, but since you've brought it up, I'm now looking into it. The press are then like, do you think that you should resign, Minister? They say no, and then they eventually do resign. Yes. It seems to be the year of fucking around and finding out. Which was your favourite ministerial resignation this year? There's been so many. And I favorite ministry. Oh, it probably Suella. I think her her post ministerial. Was, was, was that a resignation? Or was that a sacking? Resignation. It was a resignation. Well, yeah, but it was a sacking because it was done over the phone, wasn't it? Yes, yes. But um, I, I, I think I think th her lack of dignity since has been excellent. Well, I don't know what you're watching, but. I think that she displayed impeccable dignity while she was in office. Mm -hmm. So while she was the Home Secretary, this is earlier in November, mm -hmm. so this is what, six weeks ago, uh, she described rough sleeping as a lifestyle choice. Yeah. And it had cut through. It did, yeah, it did. I think, I think people, can, I, people are attuned to the vilification of some mo most vulnerable people in our society. Mm. I think, believe it or not, they care about and they don't like people seeing people being downtrodden already, being stamped on or laughed at, especially by a party that probably has, does have a lot to answer for in terms of their lifestyle choice, as, as she would describe it. Um, Do you think it was confusing for Suella Braverman at the time? Because she'd gone for various other minorities, like, you know, she'd gone for the um, the trans community mm -hmm. and she'd gone for the, the refugees and then she went for the homeless and the country went, whoa, 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 whoa. Not them. Not them. They're white. And she was like, hang on, wait a minute. <laughs> I have I have gone for every minority uh, group. And, and you're, this is the one you don't this like? This is the one you don't like? I've literally put 500 asylum seekers on a barge yeah. off the coast uh -huh. of Dorset. Yep. You don't like this one? She must have, she must have, that must have been a confusing conversation with Sunak as well. Mm. Being like, they all, they all think it. We all think, we all say this all the time. Yeah. This usually works. <laughs> <laughs> this usually works. This is usually in our manifesto. Um, but what next for Suella post-2023, do you think? Look, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's important to, to view this through uh, the Metropolitan Police and her break away from them as Home Secretary. So when she wrote that article saying oh, yeah, that the, the Met Police should... <laughs> really start arresting people oh, about the Palestine at Palestine marches, marches. Yes. Um, and then didn't say anything when the far right were emboldened mm -hmm. to take over Whitehall. You were on Whitehall I wasn't quite before. famously during that. Was that your favourite protest? No, the far right organised <laughs> The far right protest wasn't my favourite. Oh, you didn't agree with what they had to no, say? No, believe it or not, I didn't. Oh, right, okay. Um, I, I, I don't agree with the far right. I'd just like to get that on record. Um, I thought it was a pretty extraordinary day of reporting and I think the discourse around it and the fallout from it was quite remarkable. And seeing I don't seeing the far right on feeling being emboldened to march on to, to behave like that or to act like that on so Remembrance Day is a very important day to lots of people and the country treats it with such reverence and they felt emboldened to completely disrupt it and to charge the cenotaph and I still don't really understand what they were wanting to achieve by charging the cenotaph mm. because it was being defended I suppose by the police and then you see Tommy Robinson at the head of them he being emboldened as well I thought it was um, sad really that the, gov the, the Conservative government has taken no culpability for it and the Home Secretary had never apologised. 
What would she apologise for? For, for, for imposing it, for, for maybe, for recognising the power of her language. I, oh, I suppose, like, yeah. No, she, she, she oh, I was being sarcastic, but yeah. No, but, as in, but maybe she does think she has nothing to apologise for. Maybe she thinks this was an appropriate thing to do. I think that there was probably a realisation that as Home Secretary, you absolutely should not have alienated the police. Like, that's that's one. Mm -hmm. The Home Sec and the Met are like, you know, they're meant to be. Yeah, but what would the police have gone woke? What would they gone mad, gender mad? Okay, well, what, they've gone walk gender mad. What was your favourite woke policy? Um, of all time. Yeah, mine was the the Sarah Everard vigil. What? what? <laughs> I thought that was when they were at their most woke. <laughs> the police. And then I really liked the Dame Louise Casey report when they found it was institutionally racist. Yeah, I also that was thought that woke. was pretty woke. I liked well. when they were homophobic, not just to members of the public, but to each other. That yes. Very woke of them. Very very woke of them. I like when they did Pride. Yeah, that was... Uh, that's quite woke of them. That was actually quite woke of them, wasn't it, I to suppose? Be fair. Yeah. yeah. I think that is actually, that is actually maybe a definition of <laughs> police that's actually pride. The bit that they're quite. That's the bit that they're upset about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. no, the, the, we sent the police to police the pride thing, uh -huh. and now they're, 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 they're getting involved uh, in the pride thing. Oh, uh, I know they're... Do they, do they have a float of pride? Fellas, can we have gay police officers? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> is it gay to be a policeman? Um, is, is that what they're saying? It's just, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? I um, The woke woke barometer has really gotten out of hand. The woke dial has really, <laughs> has really like gone like five to midnight this, this year, hasn't it? <laughs> and I'm not sure where else they're going to go with it. So today, for example, they were talking about how this um, very, very beautiful woman had won a beauty pageant. This is in the Daily Mail. She's wearing the most incredible gold dress. Mm -hmm. like stunning, like supermodel legs. Like, you know, she's just like most, like, she's vision. But she's got a pixie haircut. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> has it gone woke? <laughs> like, Excuse me, that is clearly a lesbian. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone knows lesbians are ugly. Everyone knows that. They described, they described this person as androgynous. Now I haven't, I haven't, what? I haven't actually read into it, and so I apologise if this person also describes themselves as androgynous. But they were wearing like, a, like, a, like a, a, a bright gold, incredible dress. Mm. Actually, it was reminiscent of Beyonce's "I Am Sasha Fierce" tour. For any fans out there who mm. might who might know what I'm talking about, um, and but just had like a a pixie bob. Apparently, that's extremely woke. <laughs> Do you know who's also woke, Ben? Mm? Princess Diana. But, but she Dando. actually was a bit woke, wasn't she? Oh yeah, she no, she yeah, she was. She actually she was. She was a bit. She was awake that one. She, <laughs> She'd walking up. She really was. But then didn't um, uh, why have I forgotten her name? Who was like the the huge model in the sixties? Twiggy. Twiggy. So she'd be woke too, wouldn't she? Did you have short hair? Did she not have short hair? Did Mary Quant have short hair? I feel like a lot of women have had short hair. No, no, just, now, just, it was just the ones we're naming. I don't think it's been an issue. <laughs> just the ones we're naming. I don't think it's been an issue until Shree now, Blair? to be honest. You know what? Margaret Thatcher had a perm. So is that not a bit woke? No, because that's quite a feminine thing to do. Perms? Yeah. Perms are, perms are feminine? I think so. Who's deciding this? Me. No. Oh, uh, me. Enough. No, yeah, I'm enough. still. I'm. I'm saying that. Fair enough. You do have your your woke Bible out with you, don't you? So you're like going through it right <laughs> the now. No, like the notes you wrote me. Let oh. me just check. What else has happened that's woke this year? Political correctness gone mad. Um, political correctness gone mad. I would say probably the ten by elections <laughs> that the Conservatives <laughs> have subjected <laughs> I'm, themselves. Yeah, I'm going to call that out as a bad segue, but I'll let you carry on. <laughs> okay, so let's just like let's have a quick chat about the. Uh, so that's disingenuous. They fought nine by elections, and to their credit, they've only lost one, two, th three. They lost four seats. That's not that many. So they lost. Okay, no, but I mean, there were nine by elections completed, and they only yes. won one of them, which was Uxbridge. Which, well, actually, they didn't even win it. They, they held only it. they only held five of them. Though. They held it, but they lost Tamworth, Mid Bedfordshire, um, Somerton and Frome, Selby and Ainstree. Those were all actually uh, pretty safe seats. Before yeah, they now. completely fucking fucked it. But to be fair to them. The by-election that will be coming up in the new year, what well, might not go ahead if the election is called early enough, is Scott Benton, mm. and he is South Blackpool, Blackpool South. He is Red Wall. The Conservatives won that seat in 2019. 
they will now probably lose it <laughs> because Scott Benton was found to have been lobbying yeah, but <laughs> the look, gambling yeah. industry. But, that, but, that's not, but that's also not why he'd lose it. He'd lose it anyway. He'd lose it because of the dreadful performance of the government. Yeah, that's true. He'd, it's not, it's not, it's not, I doubt... Because there needs to be a petition now to, to see if there's a, re, a recall petition, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And so it's not going to, people aren't going to sign it because they disagreed with Scott Benton's abuse of power and misuse of his parliamentary title and stuff they're going to he's go, they're going to lose the seat because the conservatives have completely fucking lost it and the country's shit that's, well, that's why they're going to lose your it. opinion but some of us appreciate what michelle moan has done for the pp <laughs> um <laughs> let's go through Sorry, you need to actually need to declare that you're a you're a stakeholder in pp med bro well listen i've i make a lot of masks <laughs> let's just go through a couple of these reasons so chris pincher Resigned after losing his appeal to suspension due to groping allegations. Jesus Christ. Nadine Dorries resigned after being omitted from the resignation honours list. That's pathetic. Oh, Margaret Farrier, one of your law, SNP, re- recall petition after oh, breaking COVID-19. That was a bit slightly Sorry. racist. Slightly Sorry. Racist. Sorry. I, I, I'm Sorry. not going to say it was racist. All in good fun. It. All in good fun. David Warburton resigned 14 months after his suspension pending an investigation. Uh, he was accused in the Sunday Times, all the Times, one of those... Um, of being in front of a plate of drugs <laughs> oh, yeah. and having sex. Nigel Adams <laughs> and having sex resigned after being omitted from Boris Johnson's resignation on his list. The um oh Pathetic. Chris Matheson though with Labour resigned after suspension for serious sexual misconduct. The other Labour reasons are pretty fair. One just wanted to go and work for Mercy Care NHS Foundation Trust and the other one wanted to be the Deputy Mayor of Greater Manchester. Yeah, but then we also need to give the Conservatives some credit because they held Uxbridge. They did hold Uxbridge. But I, you know, that was... In hindsight, it's actually very interesting that they managed to hold Uxbridge, isn't it? I don't really buy that it turns into the de facto ULES referendum well, do you not no i don't i think it's a seat that's always been conservative and it's on the outskirts of is you know it's greater london which mm-hmm. which typically is like mm. oh sorry i also don't buy this i'm sorry i, I oh, also don't agree were you going to be pro it was yes no but then i thought about it again for a moment i was like oh yeah no it was they significantly reduced their majority yeah it's like 700 or something like that yeah, yeah no sorry no you're absolutely right i don't think it's either i think it's if it's it's a bellwether seat and yeah. the Conservatives can't chalk up what was Boris Johnson's majority like it was thousands whatever it was, uh, he was, he was yeah, and fucking. now it's less than a thousand and the Conservatives can't point to that and say well that was brilliant guys that's yeah. the fucking blueprint mm-hmm. we need more Steve Tuckwells reeling against environmental policies Whatever happened to them? We should really keep tabs on them. Maybe Who? we should come back in the new year and say what have all these new MPs done since they, they've been oh, into office? But I think we should do that would be there's other ones who we, have, who we don't know about either mm. like when you look at pmqs and there's an mp you've never heard of mm-hmm. and that's always fun mm-hmm. at least we've heard of these ones well i i guess that's all that matters then isn't it yeah just being aware of them that's all they want to know do you know what's interesting today edward something in a, a, an important follow-up happened to one of your the one of the big stories that you covered this year which is xl bullies yes so 4,000 applications um, for XL bullies to be allowed to, what, be alive after December. <laughs> it registered for exemptions. Yeah, exemptions have been approved. Mm-hmm. Oh, they've been, been approved? They have been, yeah. That's interesting. Pretty much all of them that went in got approved. But after this December, am I right in saying that they, XL bullies, if they are defined as an XL bully, they have to be out with the muzzle and on it's, the lead now? It's like muzzled, walked the lead, neutered, registered insured as like a dangerous mm-hmm. dog and if it's in like a private home um can't yeah can't breed well if they're neutered they can't be bred anyway um yeah i think that's interesting so the, all the people that i spoke to so i, I did a, for those who don't know i did a um i went to an exhibit process in westminster with sean and spoke to people who were protesting against kind of the, what they view as the the persecution of the exile bullies and lots of people were saying they are they were describing themselves as the responsible dog owners etc and this is it's the other people who don't make them look it's other it's the other dog owners who make them look bad and that was of course a tricky day for them because uh the day before someone uh oh someone had mauled someone and like 
yeah. in common or something like that. So, wasn't someone it? had been mauled pretty badly. Yeah, I th- and, but I think I think it, they, and they were also all they were all terrified that their dogs were going to have to be put down. So, for, so I suppose for them, if they are the responsible dog owner that they say they are, if their dogs are incredibly well trained, because that, that was the thing, wasn't it? There was like all these interviews with families that had exo bullies, and it was like, oh my, wee girl loves this sixty kilogram killing machine for mm-hmm. muscle. And but we've got it incredibly well trained. It's other people who aren't responsible enough to own an XL bully and care for it properly and train it that are like that's the cause of all these deaths. So I suppose this is this a happy medium between like because if a dog has a muzzle on it can't rip someone's throat out. Yeah, so that's but, yeah. That's well, that's good. I just the more that you and people get to keep their family pets. This was that all of this went on. It's absolutely wild. Mm-hmm. Like I get it if that's your if that's your dog and you love it and you've trained it. Like who am I to tell you that you've got to, you can't have that dog? Like that who am I to do that? Yeah. What I just find astonishing is the defence for, for example, for that that awful video we saw of in a park and that girl who was yeah, screaming yeah, yeah, yeah. and that dog was like charging at her and like ripping her arm mm. off and then in Birmingham wasn't there also that guy around a petrol station who nearly had his arm ripped off as well yeah how can you defend that no it, I think it's, it's well these these dogs there was there was one interview I think it was on Good Morning Britain and there's a dog ex dog handling expert or dog expert on in the studio and they're talking to a family who had a dog Mm. An XO bully, and the dog handler person was saying to the XO bully family, "Please rehome that dog. Like, if you've got ki- you've got children, really? Yeah, please just do it. That's my advice." Wow. Because she was arguing that all these dogs have the potential to just go, just go like that. Wow. Mm. Um, and then what can you do? Yeah, you it's, too, do it's, too, it's, too, it's too late at that point. And then, well, we were saying, weren't we? Ollie and I were walking up the street here where we work and mm. there was a, a man being walked by his ex XL mm. and we were like go on like it doesn't matter how big you are as a man that that thing is is bigger than you yes yeah also 60 kilos is like a sm- a light man yeah being like and I'm <laughs> trying to stop like, yeah but running full sprint trying to stop like a man trying to kill someone a 60 kilogram man and you're holding him by a rope. Yeah, it's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. And that small man is going to rip your throat out. Yeah, probably. Um, what you, this has occurred to me. What do you think about dog owners' view of, do- of their own dogs at the moment? What do you mean? Well, this is on Friday. I was, at, I was on a train and this woman had brought her dog with her on the train. And the dog wasn't particularly well trained. It was kind of like bothering a lot of people and she seemed quite reluctant to like intervene mm. and and then she was complaining that do- her dog wasn't being like people weren't making a fuss over her dog well i guess it's sort of like some parents with their children isn't it but children i get what i i think okay god this is going to really catch a lot of heat i can but some people do feel that way about their dogs some people do feel that way yes yeah. i agree they do feel that way I don't think it's the same. But they think it's the same. Yes, but they, that's not. And I would, I mean, some people's children, like sometimes. But you think as well, if like a child was like, I don't know, putting his hand in your shoe. No, but some parents don't stop that. Yeah, it's true. Actually. They don't care. They're like, oh, Timmy is just uh, investigating. And he's like, funny. Okay. <laughs> For you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know I don't know, know him. <laughs> I don't know this child. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think um, there's also like, I do, okay, so friends of mine have a very big dog and the very big dog is very well trained. Not an XL Billy, but a very big dog. Um, Legally, not an XL Billy. <laughs> no, 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 but really not an XL uh-huh. And like, I, we, we've had times before when I've been at their house sitting in their garden and the dog has like very excitedly leapt onto me and like Ooh. thrown me off of the chair. Yeah. It's fine because it's playful. Mm. However... <laughs> If there was one part of me that thought that dog would want to kill me, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be going round. Oh. Um, but they defend they defend it to the nth degree. They've kind of got it in their head where they're like, if they come for the XL bullies, they'll now come for our dogs. And then it'll just be a, a big chain. Yeah, I, I don't think all dog owners think that. Especially because well, XL bullies kill other dogs mm. as well or attack other dogs. It's not mm. just people that are at risk. There is that, isn't Although there? Although I think that should be the priority. Um... But anyway, so that legislation comes in in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. Is that maybe one of the 
biggest achievements Sunak has had this year? Well, that he's got he's banned XL bullies. Yeah. Yeah, quite possibly. What else can you point to? That's like a win for him. Um. Was Windsor Framework this year? Windsor Framework was this year actually. Yeah. That's, I suppose that's another win. Well, um, uh, oh, see, I <laughs> I think it was a win for the EU. Like. There was, okay, so that was back in, um, so the Windsor Framework, the sausage agreement, the sausage alignment, yes. as we were calling it, that was in February, Ursula von der Leyen came after they'd been attempting to negotiate what they were going to do with the Ireland question for quite some time. Ursula von der Leyen held this joint press conference in Windsor with Rishi Sunak and she looked extremely pleased. She, <laughs> too pleased, <laughs> to the point where you're like, hmm, you've hated us for the longest time here. <laughs> Why are you so happy? <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, um, Rishi! <laughs> So good to see you. Yeah, so what they agreed on was that Northern Ireland would now have to align itself with EU regulations and that would mean that goods could travel from the Republic into Northern Ireland and into good Br uh, into Great Britain. Mm. One thing that Rishi Sunak really downplayed with that is that Great Britain also now has to align itself with EU regulations, mm -hmm. which if you were an avid Brexiteer, you'd be pretty upset mm -hmm. about because I think that was one of the pinch points. You wanted to have your bendy bananas. Um, and your light bulbs or whatever the rest of it was. Yep. But actually now we've just got like a roundabout way of being in the EU, EU without being in the EU. Very good, guys. Very, very well done. Oh, you can't even do that properly. Um, yeah, nice one. No freedom of movement, but you do have to make sure that your light bulb can travel from Suffolk through to Northern Ireland, down through the Republic and then yep. over to Spain. Nice. And it's all easy and everyone's all the better for it. Mm, you could say that. Is everyone the better for David Cameron returning? That's a great question. What happened there, Ed? Um, so, as is my want when political news breaks, I was not working. I don't, did, have I talked well, about you this not. podcast? No. I was, well, this was off the back of my um, of the far-right process Palestine day. So I was off on the Monday. Ah, yes. So, but I, have a, I don't know. It's actually not happened recently, but I went through a spate of not being at work or working when there was big political news. Mm. Like when the Queen died, I was off. When Liz Trust, yeah, that's suspicious. When Liz Trust, <laughs> when Liz Trust stepped down, I was also off work. Suspicious. So, <laughs> so what was like? What was the common theme of what, what I was doing in those two events? Well, I didn't know Ed. I no. wasn't with you. That's true. That's what you're, and I maintain that Ava wasn't with me to mm. any legal inquiries. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, David Cameron has been brought back to shore up Rishi Sunak's international legitimacy mm -hmm. to give him a hand on the foreign affairs front because as a former prime minister he's had a mass he's had vast experience liaising with other governments other countries allies and in a time of a special especially especially tumultuous, volatile. volatile tumultuous international sphere he wanted, wanted to lend a hand so i wanted them back also everyone kept talking about how bored david cameron was that was bored. a big part of the story being like Oh, David Cameron's been so bored since he stopped being. Well, he prime couldn't minister. get a job after Green Cell, could he? No, true. So he was just like playing. People, <laughs> people were just texting. He was texting people asking to play tennis. Yeah, was he not getting booked for speeches? That's so insulting. Yeah, ah. Uh -huh. Even Theresa May's getting booked everywhere for yeah, speeches. Yeah, but also, like, yeah. I wonder oh, what. But to be fair, she was the architect of Windrush, so she's got like a little add-on, hasn't she? She's like, oh, look, and you guys then, and show you how thing. to be a racist. <laughs> then he he did Brexit and austerity, so he's got quite a lot to talk about. Yeah, he did. You know what's interesting? Back. Um. Actually, so so when David Cameron David Cameron returned and there was that big moment and he came back in, he was made a lord so that he could uh, take his position on the cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, there was some talk at the time. This was um, very soon after the the terrorism of October the seventh, and it was still very much in a we um, the the UK and the US got full behind Israel. And we're now in a space in the last couple of days where the US is softening on that resolve. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about the 20,000 people who have been killed in Gaza. And Biden is saying things like indiscriminate bombing, bad. David Cameron is now saying things like extremist settlers will not be welcome in the UK, stop doing it. Mm -hmm. You've got Ben Wallace, the former defense secretary, writing in the Telegraph today, this will be on Monday, sorry if you're listening to mm -hmm. this on Wednesday, uh, talking about um, Israel's killing rage and the legality of what what is going on in the Gaza Strip. It's just interesting because Cameron coming in, there was some talk about whether the policy towards um, the Israel-Gaza war would change 
with him mm-hmm. him in post has it had a direct correlation i don't know but it has softened softened there's not still there's not i wouldn't say that there was i wouldn't still say that there was morality in the argument i'm not saying that everything is suddenly crystal because obviously it's not yeah but the line has changed. The line has changed, but I think it's changed because the US's line has changed. Yeah, of course. I think like that's that, uh, it's pretending that James Cleverly would have done any been more hard. I did not for, say his name. What as a foreign? <laughs> we can't name the former foreign secretary. I know, but I, I said specifically David Cameron. No, no, but no, but uh, yeah, I suppose. But then also, like, I think because he was well into the settlements when he was prime minister. Really? Yeah, like like settlements bad. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But then, but then I think, uh, but as a, but as always our foreign policy is dictated by America. Of course it is. And he's not going to suddenly be like, actually... And we only went when Biden went. Yeah. Where he... We go where he... leads. Yeah, it's a, that's a Carol King song. Is it? Yeah. I'm not 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 massively into Carol King, so... What do you mean? I don't think I know very many Carol King songs. That's mental. Is it? Yeah. I just thought you'd like the album, Tapestry. I've never listened to it. Maybe I'll listen to it tonight. Maybe you should. Yeah. I think you'd enjoy it. I'll write that down. Um, looming large over the Conservatives mm-hmm. since October. Yeah. The spectre of Nigel Farage. Oh, do you think? Why do you think that? Why do I think that? <laughs> why do I think that it's looming large? Yeah. Well, he was at the Conservative Party conference. Mm-hmm. I could, I spotted him being lauded. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's Nigel. <laughs> uh. Excuse me, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> That's Nigel Farage. Not a member of the Conservative <laughs> Party. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Remove this man. Remove this man immediately. Yeah. Um, he was being lauded by the young Tories. But I've, I don't know. They're, they're not a great judge of character because they're swivel-eyed loons, basically. But they were, they were loving him. Um, there's been lots of talk about his potential pr- return to the front line politics after being in the jungle and um, there's been lots of dis- discussion about would he join the conservatives senior tories have said he'd be welcome in the conservative party and so yeah what, what do you think the relationship is like at the moment between farage and the tories i think that, that farage has always been very helpful to the conservatives i would argue that he won them the 2019 election not necessarily won it because i think they were going to win anyway but i think the landslide was down to him i think people really turned out to vote because of him, he was saying the things that the Conservatives didn't want to have to say themselves mm. or couldn't get their comms in order to say. And Nigel uh, Farage, you know, he was very much on the anti-immigration, get Brexit done wave mm-hmm. that the Conservatives just sort of rode onto, rode into polling day on. He made it more exact. He made his... his pr- appearance or participation made him more upset. He did the... He walked so the Conservatives could run. Yeah, he kind of thing. pulled the narrative... He just pulled the narrative, like, to the right. Mm-hmm. And no one in even the Conservative, like, upper echelons, denied that they would do any of the things that Nigel yeah. w- was, was saying. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of, like, all got convoluted. And the Brexit party got muddled in with Boris Johnson's Get Brexit Done campaign. And they sort of just aided and abetted him getting mm. in. It's one of their biggest regrets. Do you know that, the Reform Party? What? It's how much they helped, well, the then Brexit Party, how much they helped Boris Johnson get into government. Really? Yeah, one of their biggest gripes because they stood aside in a lot of places ah. so that to allow him to get in because so he could deliver Brexit. Mm. And then they're, they're obviously not happy with Britain I, or the government. Yeah, and I think it's a massive... Oh, I'm probably going to have to eat my hat this. I think it's a miss read to think that Nigel would want to be parachuted in as a lord and serve in Boris Johnson's hypothetical cabinet if Boris Johnson was to return, which was the news a couple of months ago was going to happen. I don't think, yeah. I, well, I don't think he'd return. I don't think he wants that. Uh, Farage? I don't think that Farage wants to ride on the hypothetical Boris Johnson coattails. So when those stories were coming out and they were being reported, I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, but also I don't think, I don't think Johnson would be elected. No, but I mean, hypothetically, if that were to be the case. If you were elected, he, Farage would wouldn't want to pitch. participate. Yes, I agree, actually. I think Farage would want to be, if he was involved at all, he'd want to be the main man. Yeah, of course. He, he wouldn't would. just settle for education. Ah, uh-huh. 
or something like that. He's lost it seven times now. He wants it. <laughs> but, <laughs> Lucky number eight. But anyway, one of the most important politicians in recent history. Definitely. Do you think it's interesting as well how much, how different kind of the open window is on things like immigration and stuff like that. Pe- people say things now about openly say we should one of the army shooting the people the refugees on boats crossing the channel mm. which is i think i think it's it's we're a much harder much more unfeeling country compared to a fair few years ago but that's a very it's a very vocal minority but as in but if you look at like migration watch they ha- they put up their own polling and they were acting like this proved a point but it didn't it was like like the middle the middle of people being like do not mind mm-hmm. is pretty wide mm-hmm. and the extremes of like love it and hate it are very narrow mm-hmm. most of the country are just sort of like unfazed and unbothered mm-hmm. and then they get they get <sighs> the heat turned up on them when the conservatives start claiming that there's all start convoluting figures and suggesting that 700,000 people who've immigrated here is are, are all people on small boats yes. rather yeah. than like have come here through legal channels to work. But I think it's, it's, it's become socially acceptable or politically acceptable or in the mainstream almost to have these really vehement anti-immigration mm. or p- policies or just be openly racist is also now quite acceptable in large swathes of the media and politics. But then people hate click on a lot of things and I think hate clicking sort of some some broadcasters think that just because they've got views on something it means that that's what the silent majority agree with does not necessarily true yeah i don't know it's hard to parse why people watch things isn't it but i think it, it wouldn't be people hate watch us few hate watch us but i but if you look at our there are metrics for it as we get 90 something percent likage mm. on most of our posts whereas the p- people have the option to dislike as well so i think i probably and <laughs> hate gets a lot don't of tell likes. them <laughs> Don't Be- tell and them. gets a lot of likes on his, I think as well. Should we um? Should we just talk about Gillian Keegan doing a fucking good job? Oh yeah, because she fucking rules. That was a. Let's just. Ugh. Should we end on the messiest month of the year? I, conservative I just fucking they're uh, they're contemptible. They're having they've got a shit year and they're a shit government and I think they're shat the bed entirely. And mm. this is a really good example of how they've done that. What was it, Gillian Keegan? <laughs> was it, she was a, was it a hot mic, basically. So it was. Uh, she was expressing her frustration about the crumbling concrete crisis in schools, which only affected ninety five percent of schools. The other way to read that is five percent of schools could fall down at any moment <laughs> and crush all of the children inside them. Um, and during an interview with Daniel Hewitt on ITV, after the interview, she said, "Do you know what? Why doesn't anyone say?" You're doing a fucking good job, Gillian. You're working really hard here. No one ever tells you that. And it went viral. Yes, because she's... Ugh. I think they are... It's just completely unserious. It well. is completely unserious. And also, that it kind of gives you an insight in how they talk when they go back to their departments or when they're not on yeah, camera. Yeah, great job, everyone. Yeah, they're like, oh, it's fine. Oh, it's fine that your children are... About- What's happened with that, by the way? Presumably nothing. With the rack. With the, Yeah. Those, those schools are still being used, aren't they? Well... I think they put up a lot of porter cabins, didn't they? Still. Well, I would have. Th- I I highly doubt. I would. I would put a lot of money on it that they have not rectified the issue. Which is and and it's something that, like us as well. We've forgotten for, forgotten about that. They've just that's been allowed to go away. That story about like children in death traps. Oh, do you remember when Gavin Williamson said to shut up and go away? Do you remember him? I remember Gavin Williamson. I don't Big remember Gav- shut up and go away. Oh, Russia should shut up and go away. <laughs> Your encyclopedic knowledge of random things MPs have said is quite impressive oh, thank you really that's impressive. actually quite an obvious one but I appreciate is it? that is yeah. it? is it? yeah I've never heard that before in my life mm. it's pretty it's pretty um, I'd say I'd say that's on that's on the easy level fucking hell wasn't a hard level we're not even on a oh well it's, it's, it's got to be something you know it's probably John Major legalising uh, no it's not <laughs> legalising salmonella or something no 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 I was going to say what he did legalise but it's atrocious and <laughs> October was a messy month for them so Gillian Keegan did a fucking good job and then uh, Rishi Sunak went to conference and had his entire Conservative Party conference dominated by will he won't he cancel HS2 
<sighs> yes. Have you heard about any of the um, any advancements made on the £36 billion save from HS2 that was planned to be reinvested in other transport projects? I don't know if you've been uh, looking at any procurement for new for Network North. Not often. No. No? No. Well, then that's worked out well. Yeah. It's... There's just... I don't know. I think you said this last week, was it, about we just need to stop treating them with any respect. Mm. And they've used up the last of everyone's goodwill and people just need to stop, start treating them like the dickheads that they are. They're just doing I didn't say that, things. but I like I, how you've paraphrased. Yes, I've I actually paraphrased. A lot of that was uh, Ed original there. Yeah. So I'll, I'll claim back some of the credit. You take that, hun. But then they're just doing dumb fucking stupid things that are com- going to be completely inactionable. Mm-hmm. Like they're 16 year olds, under 16 are going to be banned from social media. That's no, but it's also it's they're, big, they're in their like weird policy stage when they're just announcing anything th- and then nothing actually their, gets done with it. They're in their big fucking like kicking up a big stink about that. It's even if the law is passed, it's almost completely un- unenforceable. Yeah, entirely unenforceable. Yeah, well, I mean, it's ridiculous. And like, shows, it actually shows them up for being more incompetent than they wanted because mm-hmm. they clearly don't understand how people use social media. But also, I think it's it's also probably a lot to do with how Rishi Sunak operates. And it does show him to be very out of touch because potentially that's something that's going to work in his household. Mm. He's got children who are at um, a boarding school. Mm-hmm. It is enforceable, right? Yeah. And um, it, that's not enforceable if you're not like, I don't know, under the lock and key and belief in your, like, I don't know, what is it, matron who works at <laughs> these sort of schools? Uh uh-huh. mistress. Yeah, but if you don't have that kind of... Um, structure mm-hmm. i guess in your life then it's like it's, it's how would you re- how would you even go about policing it but does that mean as well like you can't say you're playing playstation mm. can you have your headset on and talk to people then is that part of it i bet they don't i bet they don't even know that's a thing don't isn't there like a wi-fi company that allows you to turn off if you're a parent you can turn off like gaming or whatever like at certain times oh, probably. There's, probably there's like safe search options and stuff as well but isn't that for like it's to stop them playing at like I don't know after 11 o'clock just so they go to bed but the 16 yeah, year olds not using social media is absolutely mental oh, it's, just, it's just also about it's like it's a utility as well like people communicate with their friends on Snapchat well, it's or it's whatever just, it's just super nanny state as well isn't it like you've got this huge issue with social media a huge issue with regulation and instead of going up to the upper echelons and saying to like Facebook, TikTok, and you know, well, sorry, Meta and mm-hmm. TikTok, we need you to regulate and serve sensible content to certain age groups. Yeah. Instead, it's like, no, let's go and attack the parents. Let's go and take it out on them. Yeah. Leave the big businesses, yeah. the giants to do their thing. It's stupid. It's really stupid. Everything they're going to announce from forever it's just going to be shit until there's an election. Mm, it's very nanny state, isn't it? Whatever happened with the smoking? The vape stuff? Yeah, no, no, with uh, banning smoking like New Zealand style. Because, you know, New Zealand reneged on that policy. Oh, really? Yeah. They realised, they were like... I think they're we actually, actually doing that. Like no, 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 they've reneged on Sorry, it. I mean the UK. Oh, right. But anyway, so New, Z- New Zealand have gone, oh, it's actually really expensive. We lose loads of money off of um, tax. And we'd quite like to offer tax cuts to people who are... Yep. struggling at the moment so smoke away and also if they die earlier they won't have to use this tax money to sustain them as well Success. so it's good so they, if they get into like a negative birth rate then, then maybe that's what they're aiming for all right so predictions what's the one big story that you'll be looking at in january what do you think is gonna <laughs> what do you think is gonna bleed over from the conservatives mess fuck I, I don't i don't think anything's going to change i don't think there's going to be anything they're going to reanimate the corpse of Ted Heath and make him chancellor. Ted Heath? Yes. That's my guess. That's like, nothing sensible is going to change. It's going to ki- continue on being this fucking zombie government that's not going to change anything. They're not, it's going to be Labour 20-25% in the polls until the election comes. Labour 25 Oh, you mean ahead? Ahead, ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're not, not going to drop. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to drop what do you mean? 20 points. They're going to maintain that no, and nothing they do is going to change it Rishi Sunak is going to prove himself to be incompetent shrill tetchy angry refusing to engage with any policy meaningfully and they're just going to shit in their hands 
and present it to the UK and public and wonder why people aren't thanking them for it. That's my prediction. Okay. What was your prediction? I like that. Um, I think that they are going to get Rwanda done. I think they are going to achieve Rwanda. Do you think the Supreme Court is, excuse me, the Supreme Court is not going to... I th- Yeah, I think that they are going to... I think that they will push it through. I then think they won't they won't actually be able to deport anyone because I think that human rights will supersede it and I think that whatever and I think that they'll be found out as a whole lot of chances and the Rwanda policy will be like the Why elephant. do you know what it kind of is do you know like um, it'll just be the thing that sticks on him forever not not just like the um, the um, brutality of the policy mm-hmm. But it will just be like the 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 inefficacy of the policy. Yes, and that's going to really undermine his Silicon Valley credentials. Yeah. For afterwards, going to be like, so what? What, what have you talk us through a time where you faced the challenge? <laughs> faced the challenge at work. Had to work as a team to achieve something. Yeah. Well, actually, I had to. So actually, what I did was I fired all of the team. I fired the <laughs> SHR. I fired. The <laughs> yeah. I sacked my boss. I sacked the Supreme Court. Uh. And then I, we did not manage to send a single person to Rwanda mm. at all. Um, what do you think? How do you think, say you were Rishi Sunak, relaxing over Christmas, about to listen in to the King's speech? I don't think he's going to relax over Christmas. No, no, I don't think he will either. But imagine he's pretending to relax. Hey, do you know what? I'm going to say something controversial. I don't reckon he listens to the Queen, King's speech. I reckon he gets it briefed to him, what was said. Is that controversial? I don't reckon he sits down and watches it. Well, he probably should. He should if he's the prime minister. Boris Johnson definitely did. Do you do you listen to the King's speech? We do put we put it on because, but uh, mo- mm, there's a lot of anti-monarchists. Mm-hmm. But my grandmother loved the Queen. I don't think that we'll watch Charles. I've never ever watched it on Christmas Day. Really? N- never been at a Christmas where someone's gone time for the King's speech at all. Really, not my, my my grandmother liked it. But isn't like likes it. it's not it's not an anti monarchist thing. It just isn't as in my family. I think my family in general like the royal family. So do I, they? Yeah. So I think that. Oh, we do. So so we'll sit there and then there'll you, be a you lot sit of there like, and boo. Yeah. You you sit there and there'll be a lot echo. of like oh give us something. But I think what's this, that about? <laughs> what's that? About? What's that big gold frame doing on there? Oh, how much did that cost? How much is that robe? Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, my family do not engage. So I don't. No? Think, I don't think that would be controversial. Well, it would be controversial because he's prime minister. I don't think it's in of itself controversial. I think when it was the Queen, it would have been controversial for anyone to not watch the Queen's speech. Because I think that there's like a new thing now where they're like, oh, you can't have to watch King Charles, but oh, the Queen, she was so lovely. How can you not like the Queen? Oh, there the was that South about London it. Women you know who mean? Um, I'm not impersonating so anyone that I know. Oh. <laughs> 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 right? Uh, will you be watching the King's speech? Oh, no, probably not, because I'd have to like interrupt Christmas dinner to go and... What time do you have Christmas what dinner? What speech? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. I think that's about when we have Christmas dinner. You have it at three o'clock? We're, 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 I think we have it late in the afternoon. We're late, late. Really? Yeah. What time's that? Probably like five-ish. Hmm. That's nice. What, do, you, do you have lunch? No. Does that, do you have a uh, nice breakfast? No. No? <laughs> we have like bits while we're all like having a few drinks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What would you give Rishi Sunak for Christmas? Um, sorry. Um, what would I give Rishi Sunak? Yes. For Christmas? P45. Oh, very good. What about you? Very good. I think I, sh- I can't top that. <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe like uh, one of those operations, those horrible operations to make you taller. <laughs> you know that you know that, that procedure. Yeah, like they, I do. That's they, awful. They break their shins oh in multiple God, places. Evil. But he's consent to it. It wouldn't be like. Do you think he'd like it? I, I, as a, as a, well, I think everyone would like to be two inches taller. All right, can I take my answer back and give you a new one? Yes. I would give him one of those pens that you can write underwater with. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to drown him. <laughs> no, what the? Stop this. <laughs> So right. he, might, he likes gadgets, he might enjoy it. Yeah, well, it probably has to be... It always probably has everything he wants, if you're a hundred millionaire. Yeah, what was it that Kate Middleton, when she first met the Queen, 
gave her a pot of chutney. Really? Homemade chutney, her grandmother's recipe. I don't know why I know that. No. Because I also... Don't I don't, no, I don't. I've never seen The Crown. I don't engage with any royal reporting whatsoever, but I do know that for some reason. Mm, that's interesting. And apparently she put it on the table. Ooh, is that a, is that French button? That's that's like a no no no. She gave it to the queen, and the queen had it put out on the table. Oh, so that was like a. We like that. We like Kate. We like her chutney. That was what it was saying. Maybe we can find out what her. Do you think she'd come on the podcast? Kate Middleton. Yeah. She did Radio One the other week, didn't they? She did. Um, her and Will. Chris Stark and Peter Crouch think as well. Yeah, they're trying to do. Um, they're trying to millennialize themselves aren't yeah. they yeah like, we're like a cool family ingratiate themselves with the younger people so it's like <laughs> don't give us the Charles treatment yeah the the last Charles not this Charles Charles the second the one that was beheaded right okay the first one <laughs> okay yeah, I don't think I, I don't think that's on the table to be fair well well no because when you use the guillotine it goes into the basket very good I don't think they used the guillotine they probably would went old school and went for an axe right yeah I don't, I don't think yeah because Anne Boleyn was hacked quite a bit you know that yes yeah I did know that yeah I think I, I'm quite glad we don't behead anyone anymore you'd be like begging for like a nice clean cut wouldn't you you'd like go up and you'd be a bit like brutal be like please Mr. Beheader please can was you it, be a bit a painting that's on TikTok a lot of, is it Jane Grey it's this quite harrowing painting of her being led to her execution oh yeah it's a big like renaissance style it's like I get a lot of TikToks about it being like People been like, this is just horrible. Because it is like really horrible. I think she was like 17 when she was beheaded. That's old back then, though. No, true. And she's like, but she has a blindfold on. And she's kind of like resisting. Oh. And she's that, was a little, that was a little bit of just she gave her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She, yeah. <laughs> so she's flamenco dancing. Yeah. And they, no, it's, um, it's worth a look on your phone rather than going to see it. I, don't, oh, I, well, I know nothing about this painting. I'll have a quick look at it. Yeah. I, I've been encumbered by Anne of Cleves' TikTok recently. Really? Yeah. Why? Well, like... Apparently Henry like Thought apparently she, she was well, apparently she wasn't that ugly apparently she was just a bit average looking and like there's like there's this whole bit that's debated at the moment about whether he really did she was in um oh god I can't I forgot where it is but it begins with an R anyway she was in this she was on her, on her way up to meet Henry and Rotherham no I think it was no anyway Rochester yes it was Rochester oh. and um. Apparently he snuck in in the middle of the night and like tried to kiss her. And she was like, what? Who's this strange man? And she'd seen a portrait of oh. him and his portrait looked nothing like him. He, At this he, point, he was like old, fat and gout. gouty. Yeah. Yeah. And someone like on this TikTok was like, like furiously in the comments, like he was a very good looking man, very trim until he had his jousting accident. And it was like, he's, what the hell he's, are you talking about? he's dead. Yeah, why are you? People are so odd. People are so odd. Why are you gunning for Henry VIII? Do you know what? Okay, so if you were listening and you are a Reddit user, could you please let us know on the Politics Show subreddit, why are you gunning for Henry VIII? Well, if you're a Henry VIII stan, then please, please, please let us know why mm -hmm. and why you care. And which was your favourite wife? Who's your favourite favorite wife? Okay, so like obviously when I uh, used to be Anne Boleyn, but the, since I've had like my kind of... Uh, feminist renaissance <laughs> I now think it's Catherine of Aragon she was actually she was actually a proper little girl boss is, is, she was the first one she was the first one yeah. and she was like you're free to go quietly she was like I'm not going mm. we got married in the eyes of the Pope uh -huh. who the hell are you and, and fatty <laughs> and because obviously he was very large because he was eating like 10 grouse uh -huh. a day you know, he like broke a horse's back at one point as well because he was so big <laughs> <laughs> yeah have you seen a big guy have you seen Napoleon no. Are you going to see Napoleon? No, should I? Well, there's scenes. There's a scene where a cannonball hits a horse and it, like, explodes. It's absolutely Oh, insane. I bet you like that. Yeah, it was mental. Oh, right. I enjoyed the film. Okay. Are you, I, I thought it was an interesting thing I've never seen on cinema before. I don't think we should What do you cannonball. prefer, the Napoleon or the Senate video? What did I prefer watching? Yeah. Napoleon. Oh. I didn't think there was very much depth in the Senate video. <laughs> <laughs> too short as well. If, it's, if, if the Senate, if the Senate video was three hours long, I'd have enjoyed that. Oh, oh, if oh, that just, kind of depth. It's just his runtime. No, and how so? How, how far his date went up his arse? Nice. It was that de that depth as well. Anyway, happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Thank you everyone for listening to us this year. See you in a week. So, no, you won't. It's like ten days. Oh, we'll see you next year. Um, yeah, but it's like what? What day is it now? Eighteenth. 
we'll let you back in like 10 days okay well don't miss it too much um, thank you everyone for listening this year it's been very fun I'm looking forward to doing it all again next year in a potential election year and Ollie will be back as well yeah of course he will be hopefully well we don't know stop saying that <laughs> I might sack him <laughs> um, thank you bye bye <laughs>